Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the March 17th council meeting. This is the first of our hybrid meetings. It's just technical difficulties to start the meeting. We'll try this again. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our March 17th North Middlesex Council meeting. This is our first hybrid meeting where we do have our entire council here at the council chambers, along with the CAO, Jonathan Graham, and our clerk, Jackie Tiedemann. We're able to social distance here at this. We're able to social distance here and everyone else will be coming in on Zoom. At this time, I just have a couple of words I would like to say over our pandemic, it is one year. Early last year, our lives and the lives of everyone around the world were forever changed by the emergence of COVID-19. Today, one year after the first known death of a Canadian to the disease, we now mourn the tragic loss of more than 22,000 parents, siblings, friends, and loved ones. On behalf of the municipality of North Middlesex, we ask you to reflect this week on those who have died, the healthcare workers, other essential workers who have been on the front lines of the fight against our COVID-19 pandemic. Throughout this crisis, our community has remained resilient. We thank our residents for helping neighbors, supporting local organizations and businesses, displaying signs and windows to support our healthcare workers and lending a hand wherever possible. It was announced earlier this week that the federal government is designating March 11th the one year anniversary of the World Health Organization declaring COVID-19 a global pandemic. It is to be a national day of observance to commemorate those who have died due to the virus. It's been a tough year and a heartbreaking year, but it has been a year where we have faced together. That is something we must not forget. I would also like to add my thanks to our, the council here for North Middlesex and the staff for all of their efforts through this time and their continued efforts. At this time, I will uh, do the roll call. Everyone is present. Uh, disclosure of pecuniary interests. If you have any, please uh, let Jackie know. The minutes of the previous meeting from February 24th, the budget meeting and March 3rd regular meeting and the quarter revision from March 3rd. Is there any questions or business arising on any of those? Seeing none, we need a motion to approve the minutes. Councilor McClinchy, Councilor Moyer, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, public meeting, we have uh, drainage and that is a meeting to consider for Thompson drain number two extension uh, 2020. Uh, first, I th believe it's our, it's gonna be Jonathan Lampman, I believe that's gonna speak on this. Jonathan, go ahead. Members of Council, Mayor, what you have in front of you is a report to consider the engineer's report for the Thompson drain number two. Um, the recommendation is that Council receive and accept the final report for the Thompson drain number two extension dated December 31st, 2020, prepared by Spreet Associates, and that Council give two readings for a provisional bylaw as per section 45.1 of the Drainage Act. Um, there's information there. If anybody has any questions or concerns, I can answer them. If not, you have a recommendation in front of you. Thank you, John. Uh, right now, I understand we have no one to speak from the landowners, no one speaking on this. No. And uh, the engineer, no response from the engineer. No, we, we told them they didn't have to come because there was no- Okay, uh, uh, provision for council questions. Any questions from council on the Thompson drain? No questions, we have a recommendation in front of you. Councillor Keogh, Councillor Hemming, all in favor? Carried, thank you. So we do have a couple of minutes before our first delegation, I believe. Yeah, so I think we'll go to department reports. Let's start in our first one is the off-road vehicle draft bylaw for consideration. And Jonathan Graham, you're going to. Through your worship, members of the council. Um, this would be the second time that we've seen this report come to council for consideration. One at the beginning was more of an FYI. 
Uh, so the recommendation before you is that council enact the proposed bylaw to prohibit off-road vehicles on highways slash roads within the municipality of North Middlesex jurisdiction as defined by the Ontario Highway Traffic Act. Um, I'm assuming that we've gone through some of the background, but what has changed since the last time you saw this is that we did a little bit of a landscape review. And in such, uh, the following uh, municipalities have enacted uh, a similar bylaw as presented to the council. The County of Middlesex, Luke and Bedolf, Middlesex Center, Strathroy Caradoc has tabled this to the local police board. And at the time of uh, submitting this report, Adelaide Medcalf and Tennis Center are not passing a bylaw at this time. Um, in terms of considerations that are discussion points that came up from the last time we spoke about this, uh, for clarification as proposed by the bylaw section four exemptions, please note that the Highway Traffic Act uh, exempts the following off-road vehicles and their use, farm use, firefighters, police, ambulance, municipal staff, utility companies and conservation officials, etc. cetera. Uh, that being said, the recommendation before you is that we enact a, a bylaw that would prohibit off-road vehicles are there any questions? Questions from council, Councillor Moyer. Yeah, I guess uh, I'd like a little clarification on why you feel this uh, bylaw is necessary. Has, have we had issues in North Middlesex with off-road vehicles? Um, well, the issues are complaint based, obviously that there is some general observation from the police uh, that there is a concern or a, a rotation of concerns once in a while. The biggest thing to this consideration is that the province has downloaded this decision to us. Uh, typically, the province has an overriding authority that would not allow off-road vehicles on highways. Um, but in doing so, they've made it a problem that we need to address or not address. Um, subject to not tackling this issue, we will have to inform our insurance provider that we're not putting a bylaw in place, which could affect our premium. And I haven't engaged that yet. Uh, but I'm more than willing to do that. Uh, some of the counterparts in the municipal in um, uh, Middlesex County have done that, and there is a general increase that will come. Uh, additionally, the OPP has provided uh, correspondence to the county that they would like to see this bylaw put in place. But to answer your question directly, there hasn't been any concerns uh, in, in a magnitude that would warrant its own, but there are concerns periodically through the year um, but unfortunately, by the time that we get there to enforce the ATV, is, it's gone. Uh, so this is just more of a preventative main, a maintenance, I would say, in terms of protecting our liability with our insurance. I guess my other, uh, just a clarification on just the, uh, I guess, noting the uh, Highway Traffic Act. I actually looked at it, I actually I printed it out and then I left it at work. But, uh, it, how, how do they... How do you clarify that you're in the operation of, of your farming operation? Um, like, how is that identified? Do you get a, a you know, a, a aggressive bylaw officer or, or young officer out there laying charges? Uh, then it's just going to affect the landowners. They're going to have to fight the charges, take their time. Uh, uh, so I, I'd like to see more clarity of who can and can't use that stated right in the bylaw. Through your worship, and I, I did... I did struggle with that. The problem with the Highway Traffic Act is it's subject to change and the nomenclature within it changes with it. And if we specifically identified in our bylaw, we have, there's a chance that future revisions to the Highway Traffic Act would not correspond to this bylaw and we would just have to constantly go back to it to make sure it's up to date. We can certainly do that, but in reference and in consultation with the county uh, lawyer, this was the best approach that they could come up with is that they, they identify the section of exemptions through the Highway Traffic Act, but not list them specifically within the bylaw. But we can certainly go back and explore that if that's council's direction. Okay, now it was mentioned that, I think Adrian, you'd mentioned about the vehicles, if they were licensed and insured, uh, that, that would go along with the farming operation. I take it you'd have to be farming operation and have a licensed and insured vehicle? To be uh, on, on typically with exemptions, you do not need to be licensed and insured to be on the road. If you're using it for recreation use uh, and it is an off-road vehicle, there's some discrepancy in terms of that because obviously there's some uh, motorcycles or ATVs that can hit the threshold to be safe on a road and licensed and have the odometers on them, which is and lights. That's predominantly the tipping point that you need to be able to be considered licensed those still exist through this bylaw. This is simply the people who have, don't have those provisions can't and go on our uh, highways. They can, except for the exemptions, obviously. Okay, so if, you, if they're licensed and insured, 
they can operate on our, on our roads. They're deemed a vehicle when their license is insured, as long as they have the parameters of being able to be considered a roadworthy vehicle. Um, and off-road vehicles is only the classification for vehicles who don't meet that threshold. Uh, there's various degrees of that. I'm, I'm not an OPP officer, yeah, so I'm not going to, yeah. you know, speak out of turn to that. But my interpretation is that it's a separation mainly to be for the people who aren't licensed and insured, who would otherwise use it as a recreation purpose. So someone in town who has a, a dirt bike that's under 150 cc's yeah. uh, would never go on the road, but they'd be zipping around town. Uh, that presents a problem where we have had complaints before. Okay. Yeah, we just had a, I mean, this has almost been a hot topic as a, as the water issue for, for me. So uh, there are there are a lot of concerns out there about it. Uh, would and you mainly it, from from obviously uh, farming communities? Right? Uh, so uh, through the worship uh, through your worship, uh, would you seek more clarification as it relates to farming operation and their exemptions, including the other ones? Yeah, I would think uh, just in, in general. I think the you know showing that the licensed and um, and, and insured and with the farming. And again, I don't know how, uh, you know, someone has a has a residence in a farming community and he's got an RR address on it. Is that? And that would be know. that would yeah. be an incident that they would be pulled over. And yeah. they, I would assume that they'd have to demonstrate that they're using it not for recreation, but rather for their business operation. Yeah. Um, and that, that would be subjective to when they're actually pulled over, I guess. But we can certainly go back if that's council's direction. Okay. Okay. Councilor Hemming. <clears throat> yeah. So does when it's licensed and insured, then so does that switch the liability from the municipality to to the to the operator of the piece of equipment? Uh, through your worship, that is my interpretation. That it, well, we we always carry liability and insurance if they're traveling on our roads. If an accident happens, we can be listed as liable. Um, but if they're licensed and insured, then they do carry some insurance through that process as well. Other questions? No other questions? Councilor Keel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think uh, it might, I can see where uh, Councilor Moyers come from. There's going to be some discrepancy. Should the municipal bylaw enforcement um, come into play and there's an infraction, they're going to charge under the bylaw. Whereas if it was an OPP officer that pulled them over, they're going to enforce it under the Highway Traffic Act. So I think that that's where the two need to kind of marry up so that there's some type of uniformity. Uh, through your worship, um, my understanding is that the OPP can't enforce this outside of uh, provincial highways. So on our local highways, they wouldn't be, well, if the county, they can because the county put in the bylaw. Uh, so on a county road, they can enforce it, but on our local roads that they can't. Previously, they were able to do that under the Highway Traffic Act. That's where the download came from. The province removed the authority overriding within, within Ontario and just gave it locally specifically to each municipality. Um, but I'm, I'm more than willing to seek legal advice in terms of that interpretation. I'm, I will be the first to admit this is a very vague download. Um, and it is a reaction because it is something that insurance wise keeps us, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a void. So we want to make sure that we fill that void as quickly as possible and appropriately. Uh, but there's a lot that I could see coming out of this in the next year in terms of special interest groups, people who are in accidents, OPP lobby, those type of things. So we can certainly take the same approach that Adelaide Metcalf and Thames Center has where we just wait and see. Uh, but then we're, we could be in a situation insurance wise that we're liable so the the other side of this is if we don't pass a bylaw if we don't pass this bylaw they can run them in town correct like that's the others without a bylaw that it's everyone can run them in town correct uh, through your worship uh in on only on municipal roads yes yeah so and you there's not private on county property, road there's but private property issues, there's trails That's, and stuff like that. That, But I'm still, I'm just saying though, they could be on our streets, put it that way. They can. Okay. All right. I just want to clarify. So it is a double-edged sword. Is there any other questions on, the, on this? And it is a, and I talked to a couple, I will say I talked to a couple of OPP officers and I asked them their interpretation because I have a side-by-side. -side. It's licensed, it's insured. I said, if I'm going down the road, are you, are you going to stop me? 
And I heard one fellow say yes, and one said no, that as long as you're not on the county road, I wouldn't. So there, cause, because it's new, I think that's the biggest problem is how they're gonna interpret it. But uh, yeah, so that, and that's, so I just thought I'd ask him when I was, yeah. when I saw them, so. Okay, other questions? Councilor Moyer? So, so I'm just wondering, do you, do you think that you could change some wording there to, to do some clarification on it? And Through your worship, I'm, I'm more than willing to, and the clerk and I spoke about that previously, is adding some exemptions in there that's a little bit more prescribed, uh, but we would have to make it an occurrence to make sure that our interpretation is correct, probably on a yearly basis, to make sure that it's accurate and up-to-date, which is, which is fine as well. Um, it's just this allows us to be covered and we can certainly do that if that but it would almost be a carbon copy of the discussion piece that's coming from the highway traffic act to a certain extent it's very loose because especially with farmers uh, firefighters and uh, uh, some staff and utility companies you could have a whole whole magnitude of vehicles out there uh, so they they want to keep it very general Jackie um, and I think I'd just like to add a, a couple um, things too, is that I, I don't think, again, it's it's going to be a lot complaint driven. I don't think, is if this goes in, I think it creates less confusion if it's county roads, municipal roads are treated the same because of how they dissect. I think it's more confusing now that the county has set the bylaw for the municipality and trying to get uh, individuals in the community to not always knowing whether they're on county roads or municipal roads. And honestly, I, I have not had any complaints or heard any complaints in the rural area. I don't see it being a rural area issue because if they're going from farm to farm or down the gravel road, I, that is not gonna be a target for pulling people over on, unless the OPP deems it, that there's something they should pull it over. But I think what it does provide is it deters in the uh, communities, like in the more urbanized areas of the perception that it can continue. And, and again, a few bad apples make it bad for everybody. But, and I think, you know, Councillor McClinchy, we've talked before about it. There is an evident issue in, in Park Hill. And I, I think from that perspective of making uh, a deterrent that they are not if they would just go to point A to point B is one thing, but I think it's the continual up and down the rail track, up and down the main streets in the middle of the streets, causing safety concerns to be quite honest. I, I really don't see it being a rural um, problem if it was implemented. I, I don't think the target is out there. I think it's very respectful on how they go from farm to farm using it in the agricultural way. I think it's more in these communities. Okay, Councilor Moyer. Yeah, no, I agree. I think I understand that. It, it just, my concern is just, I guess, just the clarity that, you know, issues do pop up or people end up defending themselves when they, you know, it's a waste of their time when they really don't need to. If, if we had just have some clarity in the bylaw, they have something they can point to that, you know, yeah. satisfies everybody. Through your worship, we can certainly attempt to kind of reference the Highway Traffic Act, which it does right now and give some insight to it on a general sense so we don't have to revisit it every year, but we'll have to go back and craft that. Okay, and, and I agree in the rural area, I think the biggest complaint there is four wheelers going through people's fields, farmers' mm -hmm. fields and, and wrecking crops. I think that's a bigger problem than on the road. So. so what's council's wish? We have this in front of us. The recommendation is to pass it, but Councillor Moy, you're asking for some clarity. Okay, so you just need direction. You don't need a motion, I don't think, for that, do you? Because we're just we're sending it back for clarity. Mm -hmm. So, so council specifically, could what they could what, defer their decision until yeah. the draft bylaw has come back. Okay, so we do council. need a we need to need a motion to defer it to come back with it. Councilor Moyer, Councilor Keel, all in favor, carried. Okay, so you're clear what what looking for. Okay. All right, it is 6.20, do we have, uh, Mike, do we have our first delegation ready? We do, Sean and Arlene are here. Excellent. Uh, so our, our first delegation is at Thames Valley School Board Trustees, and it is Arlene Morell and Sean Hunt that's gonna join us. There they are. Welcome to both of you. 
Long time no see for sure. <laughs> well, and uh, it is very nice to see everyone as best we can during these COVID, uh, these COVID times. So Mayor Rob, members of council, thank you so much for inviting us. Sean and I are delay delighted to participate and to provide uh, two updates. So we begin, I would like to say that uh, Sean and I are not speaking on behalf of the board, but we are here tonight in our role as elected trustees for Middlesex County, and that we continue to be committed as a team to the constituency that we, that we serve. As I started to say, we have two updates for you this evening. Our first update is related to Medway Secondary School. Our senior administration through the superintendent have deemed that Medway is no longer accepting students out of area. And this means for the North Middlesex students that, uh, and North Middlesex students that they must remain in their home school in uh, North Middlesex. And hence why we are here this evening asking for your support. We know that some families might be upset that their children will not be able to attend uh, Medway, but we also know that we have an excellent North Middlesex school and that students are as well served in North Middlesex as they are as in any school in Thames Valley, in Sean and I's very humble, humble opinion. <laughs> Well, we certainly hope that you will support this decision by senior and men to ensure that students remain at North Middlesex and that you will help us in promoting the excellent school there right in, uh, in North Middlesex. And that if you hear that families are upset by this decision made by senior and men, that you will let us know, but the, that you will also join us in promoting the excellent education that students receive at your local, at your local school. And then our second update is related to budget. In the Thames Valley Board, the budget season has begun. And uh, as you are aware, every year we through a budget, our budget process, put additional staffing in our small rural schools and certainly North Middlesex is one of our small rural schools that's a recipient of additional staffing lines. Again, we're asking for your support and your assistance. There is a budget survey that is available on the board's website. And perhaps this would be a really great time to promote, uh, to support and to promote uh, the excellent education that students receive at North Middlesex through the additional staffing lines and perhaps fill out the survey in terms of, of asking for support related to the additional staffing or the additional teachers that are supported through our budget to North, uh, North Middlesex. Certainly um, those uh, additional staff have meant so much to the students there. We've seen such excellence in our graduates at North Middlesex, and we hope to be able to continue to support uh, those teachers and the excellent school in Park Hill. Those are two updates for you this evening. And uh, as I always say, and Sean will laugh, uh, Sean will be happy to answer any questions that you have for us this evening. <laughs> And again, thank you for having us. Thanks, Arlene. Uh, I'll start by saying thank you. It is good to see everyone uh, tonight and uh, nice, nice to join you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. It's the first time I've seen you, Sean. You always, I'm seeing on Facebook, you always have your drones out and uh, <laughs> showing us the countryside. I like that. Well, I've been spending a lot of time. My family's been spending a lot of time out the conservation area and lots of areas in North Middlesex, so. We're Very thankful nice. for that opportunity. Very nice. So, so we'll start uh, questions from Councillor comments. Councillor Nickel. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions. My first one: uh, Medway is no longer accepting students um, from outside their area. Will the same follow through with Strathroy? It's a question both Sean and I asked the superintendent. Sean, would you do you want to respond with the? Uh, Superintendent's response. Um, the, I think that there is a uh, a consistent message that uh, that the administration would like to see students attend their own home school, so that where where we can provide the right programming for everyone in their own community. Thank you, Sean. The other 
question um, that I have is with online learning um, over the past year, um, do you see a possibility of the students being registered through North Med? Um, because they, uh, online has been quite successful for some students. So I was just wondering if you're seeing any, any change there or any comments from students and their parents about online learning uh, versus in class. Um, the, the board has conducted several surveys and there, there certainly are a lot of different experiences around online learning, but I should clarify that all students are registered in their home school, even if they're doing remote learning, they're not um, removed from the roles of their local schools at all. Um, and there's a uh, particular effort made to keep them engaged with their local community too. Um, our, some of our smaller rural schools had a lot less um, online participation. I'm learning kind of anecdotally, um, but they're, the experiences are different depending on you know, uh, the students' individual learning styles, access to internet, obviously. Um, but there, there is a constant follow-up that the administration is doing to, to reach out and, and understand those needs. Did that answer your question? Pretty much. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> Other questions from council? Other questions from council? Councillor Moyer? Hi, Sean and Mar Arlene. Um, yeah, we had a, through a, this is actually a question from the rec committee that we had last night of uh, sort of shared use of the, of the properties, the, uh, the high school property, the uh, track, the, and, and the, uh, possibly the gym. I know it's been, uh, sounds like it's been difficult over the past few years to, um, I guess, to have, have the use of those, of those facilities. Is there any talk that uh, municipality and, and the board could work together on, uh, on, on the use of uh, properties? Shall I start, Sean? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, really, really great question and certainly through community use of schools, um, I believe, um, and in my opinion, there's an expectation that municipalities and the school board should be uh, looking at how it is that we are good partners in use of in use of, of facilities. So certainly, this is a question that Sean and I can take back uh, through uh, through the superintendent and to community use of schools to uh, to further investigate and and see how we can better support. Uh, shared use of, of our facilities. Thanks. Okay, other questions? I'll, I'll just add to that right now, there's very minimal use of community facilities because of COVID. Um, there, it's the community use permits that usually be in place are generally pretty limited right now. And, and I think Sean, that's in everything, right? Our, our community centers and everything, they're just not being used, but. Hopefully going forward, I think that's what you were referring to, weren't you, Councillor Moyer, when things uh, return back to whatever normal is, if it can happen. So other questions from Council for them? Uh, so one thing I'll mention is, uh, Sean and Arlie, maybe you'll remember we met, a number of us met at East Williams School. We had an evening meeting there and the question was asked of me what is there going to be any growth for that will impact East Williams School? And I think I said, I'm in the next 10 years, and I think I said, I'm hoping to see 150 to 200 homes. And I remember, Sean, you said, that's pretty aggressive. And I said, yeah, but sometimes you got to feel aggressive. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask Jonathan Graham to, to do a bit of an update of what's happening with growth in North Middlesex. It's a pretty exciting time. Uh, through your worship, uh, members of council and to the board, uh, uh, it looks like in the hopper, we have some more aggressive planning coming through. And once you open those gates, things just to kind of flood in. So we'll be bringing a report to council in the next couple of months, uh, possibly next month. Uh, but right now uh, in the hopper in pre-consultation form, we're looking at in the neighborhood of another three to 400 homes, including Westwood Estates, which is at 118. So we're in the neighborhood of 
discussing five to six in the next five to 10 years. You know, the planning process is the planning process that takes a number of years to get these things through. Uh, we do have a little bit of staggered uh, thanks to Westwood Estates that they're taking the lead and the market seems to be established. Um, we are in, and it's kind of hard to identify is this cross pollinization of COVID people moving out. Uh, but as everybody knows around the table, Southwestern Ontario doesn't really seem to have skipped a beat uh, in, in terms of development and, uh, and growth. Uh, so if I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the, uh, the mayor, I think we were under when we talked about this yeah. the last time. Uh, so a lot to come in the next three to four years and a lot to consider, including capital projects that come out of that. Um, so my, I'd pass it to other senior staff, Mike Barnier or Jonathan Lantman, if there's anything that I missed. Mike or Jonathan, you want to add anything to that? I think that's just a, an overall view and uh, it's pretty exciting times and it's, and it's important that yous are in on the loop for this as well because I, if I understand it right, um, the, school, the schools don't really look at growth until they see the homes in place, correct? Like they don't really, I, but there's so much forward planning going on here that it's, I think it's important that they're aware of this. That you are aware. Yeah, this is fantastic news, and will be um, good news with um, the facilities that we have to be yeah. well utilized, and um, that's great. Great to hear. Yeah, Mike Bernier, you were going to add something, I think. Yeah, <clears throat> through your worship, I just did want to point out that at the beginning of every subdivision stage. Um, the school board is one of the first to be notified. So it isn't until the house is built, but they are notified at the, the, the original circulation. So, so that's a good point. Do the trustees get, get that news as well? Or does that get put through to the trustees at the same time? Sean or Arlene? Maybe I think that, can... that, that shared information uh, between county planners and municipal planners and the board planners would be reported annually in our annual accommodation report where okay. we look at it would be reflected back to us. But it's, uh, it's always good to know and be ahead of the curve on those things. Okay. All right. All right thank you. Anything else from council? Nothing else? Uh, well, thank you, Arlene, Sean, very much for joining us. Uh, maybe next time we can actually be here at Park Hill at the, at the council chambers. Take care. Thank you. Looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Arlene. Uh, at this time, Mike, do we have our next, do we have Kathy Wilmsey? Uh, through your worship, yes, we have Soy and Kathy coming in right now. And okay, so yeah. it's the YMCA partnership report for 2021. Uh, Kathy Wilmsy and Soy are going to present that. Go ahead. Oh. Good evening, Mayor Rupp and fellow councilmen. Uh, thanks for letting us come in tonight to uh, make our presentation. I wanted to uh, introduce you to, as you know, Lindsay was expecting and went off in December and had her twins. So in her place, Soy is taken over while she is on maternity leave. He currently works with all the kind of we renamed ourselves the 402 region. And uh, he is based out of Strathroy and Kamoka. So he offers and comes out and supports us here in Park Hill now. And we've quite enjoyed having him out here. So he will uh, help with some of the presentation tonight throughout the um, evening. So I just uh, wasn't sure if, Soy, if you'd like to say anything before we get started. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kathy. Put me on the spot. It's a, it's a happy to be here with you guys. Uh, thanks for having us and giving us this opportunity to report back. Uh, you know, it's been a challenging year in 2020, but uh, Kathy's done a tremendous job with the operations there in, in Park Hill. So we're, we're looking forward to, to 2021 and uh, get things back uh, up and running. So, okay, so, uh, so I guess I wanted to find out if, do you need me to share a screen for you guys? Yes. Screen shared? Yes, please. Okay, okay. I already so, gave Soy the co-host, but you need it, Kathy? That's fine. Uh, Soy can do it. Nope, Soy's going to share his screen, okay, and then I will work off of that. 
And at any times, if we're talking and you have a question, don't hesitate to, uh, to ask away as well. Um, yeah. Sorry, just give me one second here. It is always confusing getting through that share screen on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's these uh, privacy settings on, on my Mac. Do you guys see that okay? Yep. Perfect. All right, yes, Catherine. Okay, so just uh, throughout my presentation tonight, I'm just gonna kind of give you some facts, some uh, things off the screen, and then at the end or, or at any time, if you have any questions, like feel free to ask away. So the beginning here, as you see in the middle, we have currently 273 members uh, that have uh, come back from since COVID has started. Uh, so, and just a few overall facts there that I thought we should kind of point out. Super impressed with our uh, strong kids money that we have raised uh, during 2020. So that's probably the most we've raised to date and the staff have done a great job with that. Um, we were really excited for just a brief over there with the day camps, we were able to have 95 kids uh, attend summer camp last year with even with all the guidelines and everything that was in place and, and ensured that they had a great time. Uh, pretty much uh, just a few general, a uh, little bit of information there for you. Uh, again, if you have any questions, ask away. If not, we will kind of move on. Sorry, we have a uh, question from the Deputy oh. Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Yes, Rob. sorry, is there a hand? Oh yeah, there is a hand up thing. Sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor uh, Kathy, on the 273 members, are, are they active? Currently active, yes. So the 114 that are on hold, is that in addition to the 273? Yes. And the 159 cancellations? That is on top of that number as well. Okay, okay, yeah. thank you. So the number in the middle, like you said, is current is active current members that have come back. All right, go ahead. Okay. So I just wanted to kind of reiterate, share with you again, the, uh, the fee that you guys uh, pay for each year is just this I just thought would be good to reiterate all the services that come with that fee. And we've been very uh, thankful to get all this support from um, different head departments in the YMCA. So I thought I would just kind of throw that out there as to all that, all the support that comes here through your management fee. And if I happen to miss a hand up, just kind of like shout, shout out again for me, please. Yeah, so go I ahead, Kathy. I'll let you know, Kathy, if there's okay. a question. All right, so here we have a new program that has since started up since we reopened in August, and it is called Listen 360. So a lot of the sites, most of the sites introduce this program where it allows members to give feedback, both positive and negative, uh, because even though we can talk to them when they come into the center, sometimes what they might not want to say to a person's face, but they will so if when a member swipes in, they will get an email asking for their feedback on their experience or how much they would be willing, to, how would they be willing to uh, promote the why. So here, we, I quite enjoy the Listen360. It gives us an opportunity to kind of reach out to the members that might not be happy to see why they're not happy. And it also gives us an opportunity to, you know, thank the members that have uh, said positive remarks or um, given some praise to staff. So we get uh, an update on this each day. And uh, currently, so I threw a, just a few remarks that members have made. Um, currently, I believe we are sitting at about 86% here at North Middlesex of, of people's positive uh, remarks. 
So I quite like 360. It gives um, that nice connection with the members. So here, what I really want to reiterate was my staff and how engaged they felt throughout um, 2020. As everyone knows, it was a difficult year for many people. So we closed our doors in March. And then throughout the summertime, we were closed, reopened our doors in middle of August. So and then stayed open until December and then closed again from Christmas until the middle of February. So during that time, we wanted to reach out to employees to make sure that employees were feeling still connected and feeling like they were still part of a team. So we took a, a survey of staff that were both uh, laid off and staff that were working. And I'm happy to say that the staff here at North Middlesex felt very connected with um, each other still with the YMCA and rated us within the top five of the association. So I always like to thank my staff and say that they've done a great job because it's them that makes this place such a welcoming place to come to. So um, I'm, I'm happy with the staff, the way the staff have kind of stepped up, made it a, a great year, even though we have definitely seen some challenges. So I really think um, my staff deserve like a huge thank you for the work that they've put into all of this. I wanted to just kind of highlight a bit of 2020. Uh, I mentioned a bit with the strong kids there. So throughout Strong Kids, we did the Dancing with the Stars in 2020. We did a family breakfast on family day. And we also did the Smile Cookie campaign through Tim Hortons, which we have become the recipients again for this year. So with those three uh, activities and donations that were made by members, we were able to raise over $13,000 that stays here and supports families and youth in uh, memberships, camp activities, uh, things where they may find a barrier. And of course, in this year, we are finding that uh, a much higher priority. So I mentioned briefly earlier with summer camps, we had some great success and the staff and the kids had a great, uh, a great experience. So going forward, we're going to be offering a few more summer camps this year. I'll chat a bit that, about, about that a little bit further on but uh, great success with summer camps. While we were closed between that March and August timeframe, we reached out through member calls to a lot of the members just to kind of see how they were doing, engage with them, make sure that they were doing okay. And there was quite a lot of great, like a lot of great response back just because they were feeling still connected to the why, connected to people because we were just kind of reaching out and checking up on them. So that was a great success, both on staff and members. Before we closed in March of 2020, we had introduced what we called 55 plus days. Uh, currently, we've kind of put them a little bit on the back burner just due to guidelines and number of people that are in the facility. But when they were uh, up and running, we had great success with those. So 55 plus days were every Thursday, member or people in the community 55 and over could come into the facility for free from 8 till 2 p.m. Uh, and quite a lot of uh, 55 and over people took advantage of that. And it was also a social thing as well. So we haven't gotten rid of them. They're just kind of on the back burner for now, more until we can kind of get into some type of new normalcy, whatever it looks like. Um, but uh, again, very successful for those days. If you've been into the facility, you'll notice we've installed some TVs in above the cardio, which members have greatly appreciated kind of gives them something to do while they're either running or biking. So that was a nice addition to the fitness floor. Uh, we did a huge amount of food drives this year and, and community participation for Elsie Craig in the food bank. So each of the activities that we talked about, Dancing with the Stars, the Family Day, we did a couple Santa runs. If 
Uh, you'll see a few pictures in here, both here in Park Hill and in Elsie Craig. And for each one of those, we asked for donations and then took them all to the food bank. And it was a great, a, a great experience this year to be able to kind of provide for them. And instead of staff uh, gifts that we would normally get for each other, we had decided to support a family this year from the YMCA um, in the community. And that is an amazing program and certainly def, uh, needed in it. So it was uh, really a, a good experience and definitely something that we'll continue to do each year. Uh, we also uh, implemented with all the guidelines and everything that comes out with COVID of uh, spacing, cleaning, a uh, number of people within the facility. Uh, when we reopened in August, we had to really kind of take a look at what the guidelines were and how we could make them work. So we introduced a variety of uh, COVID, COVID protocols. And each time we've kind of changed colors, we've always kept those protocols in place because we feel that members are, they feel safe and knowing that we've implemented those extra protocols. So whether we're in orange, yellow, red, or uh, those three colors, whatever protocols we implemented, we've always put in so that we are above and over what we're technically supposed to do, but members feel that safe, uh, that safe environment to come back to. So we've kept those in place. And uh, lastly, we've really improved on our virtual program. Like everybody else, we've had to kind of relook at what does, what is fitness looking like? Uh, and especially for those members that don't feel comfortable yet, we've really improved in our virtual program offerings for every age group. So we've improved and increased our number of group fitness classes. We've offered virtual babysitting, home alone, social times, game nights for people. So we really wanna keep those, those members or the ones that kind of sign up for them feeling connected and engaged. So we've improved and definitely have gotten better each time that we have done that. So we're pretty happy with that. Uh, we did uh, take part in a bunch of different community activities. We did have Dancing with the Stars, like I said, which was a huge success. Uh, we did take part in the family day activities and had some uh, breakfast and activities happening over the community center. We did also participate in some outdoor classes throughout um, October, or, sorry, August when we reopened till the colder weathers. So it's always great to get outside. Um, so we had some great success with that. Uh, we had the smile cookie campaign and then we also participated in the Christmas lighting uh, competition as well. So as challenging as 2020 was, we also had a lot of great successes come out of 2020 as well. So I wanted just to kind of reiterate Strong Kids and kind of give a little uh, information just to refresh everybody on what it is. So we've raised some money for Strong Kids and what it allows is families to get over that barrier uh, that financial costs might uh, have for them. So if a family is looking for memberships or a person is looking for memberships or youth activities, summer camps, any money that we raise for strong kids actually stays here in the community. And we use that to offer support for um, somebody that might be struggling. We've, uh, we've also opened up the process on how to apply for financial assistance to make it a little bit easier and hopefully a little bit less, um, like a little bit of that less of the stigmatism to it so that they can come in. It's not as structured as what we used to do when we were offering uh, financial assistance. So hopefully with promoting it, we're able to get, you know, we all know of the families that uh, anybody, especially during these times that can need, that can use a little bit of support. Um, so we often talk about it more so now with families coming in and everyone is, very grateful for 
this opportunity to be able to know that they can still come and do something and not have to worry about that barrier for them. Lastly, so this is our year in 2021. We want to focus on uh, not some, I mean, we always need to focus on financial, but we also want to kind of find a focus on retaining and engaging those members and keeping them engaged. 2020 has definitely thrown everyone for a loop and 2021 is in the same direction as to really, you really don't know what's going to happen from week to week. So our main focus for the year will just kind of how we can connect and continue to connect with members that still perhaps don't feel quite comfortable enough coming to the facility, but we still want them to know that we're thinking about them and they are part of our community. So staff, like I said, my staff do a fantastic job of making it a welcoming place and hopefully taking away that first barrier that a lot of people feel of even just walking into a gym. So we have uh, just made sure that staff are available for when people come in during peak training times. We've offered staff training for, um, for them both coming back because some of them have been off for quite some time and then new training that has developed over the course of some closures. And then we just want to make sure that we continue to keep the hours of operation in times where we find the, the need is in the community. So with summer camps, I'm super excited about summer camps. Well, I was super excited about everything, but summer camps this year is a little bit different. We so far have the okay to go ahead with summer camps. And our ratios this year will be two to 15, two staff to 15 kids. So far, again, things could change right up to um, the startings of camp, we don't know, but we're going by the guidelines that we, uh, that we ran camp with last year. And towards the end of summer last year, our guidelines allowed us to have two staff to 15 kids. So the plan for camp this year is we will offer nine weeks of summer camp here in Park Hill. And then on top of those nine weeks, we've also added in four weeks of summer camp in Elsie Craig. We weren't able to offer Elsie Craig last year just due to guidelines and staffing. So this year we've kind of put it in an addition, actually. I didn't budget for Elsie Craig, but I feel like there's a need for uh, the camps in Elsie Craig. So I've gone ahead and planned out four camps on top of the nine that we're offering here in Park Hill. And uh, so we're super excited about that. The staff that came or did camp last year are all coming back again this year. So uh, the kids had a great, uh, great summer experience. So I'm excited for camp this year, knowing that we're going to be able to kind of do the same things that we had in place for last year. And lastly, we want to kind of make sure that our community events kind of stay at the forefront. It's kind of a little, I have a lot of ideas. I always have a lot of ideas. Um, but the difficult part is we just never truly know how we can implement them because of numbers and guidelines and, and what, it, what can happen. So I've actually chatted with Brandon a few times and we've kind of come up with a few options, opportunities of of things we could do for the community and then hopefully as guidelines as summertime comes and guidelines are kind of under some type of consistency that we can go forward with some of these opportunities for the community because I feel like you know 2020 was just a, a mess of things starting and stopping and really uh, missing the connection of people. So I'm hoping that throughout the summertime, as things become consistent, we can implement some community activities, again, for everybody, not just the YMCA. I'm going to pass this off to Soy now. He's my financial wizard. And I will uh, let him sit there and explain for you. <laughs> 
Thanks, Kathy. Uh, and yeah, I do have to apologize. I, I believe the version that was sent to you uh, did have a couple of uh, typos on it. Uh, so the version that you're seeing now here on the screen is uh, is the most up to date. I believe it was the first column uh, that had the the revenue and the total expenses exactly the same. Um, and it said management fee instead of contribution. So uh, those were the only typos um, that were on there. But um, as you can see for 2020, uh, the board approved budget um, had us coming in at uh, lo looking at a loss of almost $6,000. Um, but with, um, I also do have to mention, these were pre preliminary numbers that were given to us from our finance department for 2020. So we're still being audited right now. They're hoping to wrap that up within the next couple of weeks. So we should have final audit numbers uh, to share with you um, in, in a few weeks time. Uh, but but the preliminary numbers that were shared to us in, in January had um, had us actually contributing and seeing a surplus of $25,000 um, over the course of 2020. Um, you know, we did see a reduction in revenue, uh, but the SUES program has really been a, a saving grace for us. Um, as you can see there, uh, you know, we were able to, to get uh, $35,000 in, in, in aid from, from, the, from the SUES program uh, from the government. So that has been extremely helpful. Uh, we did also see some savings in, um, in, in the expense line as well, uh, which helped to contribute to the $25,000 for 2020. Um, when we were building the budgets for 2021, um, this was back in October. Um, and so, uh, you know, at that time we were back in somewhat full operations. Um, so we did have some steady revenue coming in. Uh, so we based uh, a lot of that on, on what was happening in October and November. Um, so the board approved budget this year had us coming in at, um, at a surplus of $4,900. Now we've had to, uh, obviously with the closure in, uh, in, in December going into February, um, we did uh, in our last forecast, um, we did account for zero revenue in, in October and some uh, very little revenue in February as well. Um, and then March going forward. Um, what we did was um, we, we took the, the revenue, uh, average revenue from November and October of last year, just because it was more realistic to what our operations are like at this time. Um, and we spread that revenue out over the course of the first, um, the first, uh, first half of the year, where we start to see a full ramp up back into full operations is in the fall. Um, so with the latest forecast, uh, this also includes February actuals, we're actually coming in at, um, at a deficit of $19,000. Now, um, we do feel confident that we can close that gap. Uh, like Kathy mentioned earlier, the, the camp in Elsa Craig that we're looking to offer this summer was not budgeted in, in this uh, budget. So we'll, we'll see uh, increased revenue there. Um, and then the SUS program, uh, we've factored in a little bit, uh, but we just don't know the exact amount yet. So we, we know for sure that will that will help the bottom line as well. Um, and obviously, Kathy has done a great job of, in managing the expenses as we go along. Um, so we'll start, we'll continue to do that. And, and hopefully we will close that gap um, to, to closer to what we were at for the board approved, uh, board approved level. Um, and then lastly, the bottom of the, the screen there, um, just an overview of, of the current, um, cur current agreement. Again, um, I believe the last the extension was signed uh, in July of 2019 uh, for, for a period of three years. Uh, and then there's just that breakdown of, uh, of the shared services allocation fee uh, that has been paid to us over the last couple of years. Um, and the last column there with the pro forma, I, I believe the, the membership target pro forma was 350. Uh, we ended 2019 at 413. Um, and as uh, Kathy mentioned earlier in the previous slide, we're currently sitting at 273 active members. Uh, what we've seen with a lot of our smaller sites is that uh, the rebound is a lot quicker. Um, because our members at the smaller sites are not used to having the amenities that our bigger sites do, like with a pool, with a hot tub and sauna. So they're used to having the same amenities that they had before pre-COVID. Uh, so we're confident that those numbers will pick up fairly quickly once we start to ramp things back up. Um, and yeah, is there any questions on, on this slide at all? Any questions, Councillor Nickel? I was wondering if you could give us a more detailed um, clarification on the compensation uh, for the 2021 um, budget. If you could break down that, what that compensation is. Yes. So um, that is um, all of the, that will include uh, Kathy's full-time salary um, and all of uh, the part-time support that we, that we will be bringing back to, to help with our operations. Um, again, it, it will include uh, summer camps as well. Um, but we've uh, we factored in uh, from March going forward to have a full complement, uh, not not 
quite full complement of staffing back, but it, uh, we will see uh, a lot of our part-timers back, especially in our membership services uh, department. Our child and youth programs, um, you know, we've budgeted for it to, to happen uh, in May. Um, so that's when uh, you'll see the compensation for our child and youth programs uh, come back as well. And then our, our group fitness and adult uh, health and wellness uh, programs, uh, we've we factored in to start in March as well. But again, it, the colors of the of the zones that we're in will kind of dictate uh, what we can run and what we can't run. Uh, but as far as the compensation goes, um, that is um, all part-time staff for the entire year, including um, Kathy's full-time salary as well. And there is a portion of um, Sue's that is accounted for, um, but that uh, that could fluctuate um, as as we start to bring more programs back in. Did that answer your question, Councillor Nickel? Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay. Deputy Mayor Cornelison. Thank you, Mayor Rob. I have a question on the uh, municipal management fee and the operational agreement overview. So mm -hmm. if I look at that, then in um, 2020, the agreement states uh, $52,379. So the municipal management fee of $25,499, is that in addition to the agreement? Sorry, um, like I mentioned before, that should say contribution, not management fee. Um, so if you look on the current slide, um, that was one of the typos that, uh, that, um, that I was speaking about. But yes, that 25,000 is, um, is the surplus of our operations. I'm sorry, could you, I didn't quite understand that. That's 20, represents what? Uh, the surplus of our operations for the year of 2020. And that came from the municipality? No, that's, that's through operations. Uh, like I mentioned, that, that uh, row, it shouldn't say municipal management fee, it should say contribution uh, operations. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, other questions? Uh, I have one for you, Soy, and that is that 19,124 shortfall. Mm -hmm. uh, my question to you is that the province has different funding streams for COVID impact. Mm -hmm. Is there, not for, is there a not-for-profit funding stream for the Y to help recoup some of that or? Yeah, I believe our development team um, is looking at, at that as a whole for the association. Um, okay. I, I, I don't know exactly what the specifics are um, for, um, for North Middlesex specifically, but I know they're looking at uh, all those options uh, to ensure that we do get the, the funding that we need to, to support our operations for sure. So then the Y though, would they put back to each Y that is that is has that shortfall? Would that go to, back to each Y, or would it stay at their at the uh, parent organization? You know, for lack of a better term. Yeah, I believe when they do apply, I don't know if it's set by regions or if it's set by uh, by the association itself. Uh, but um, if they do get any funding, it will be uh, allocated um, separately to to each site. Okay. All right. That was my question. Other questions. Council, no other questions. Uh, Brandon, I think Brandon's with us. I can't see him on the screen, but is there anything you'd like to comment or add to the report? Uh, yeah, just through Mayor Rob to Deputy Mayor Cornelson, just uh, an easy way to think of it is for your 2020 question. We paid them the 52379 and we actually got back 25491 So they would have ended up paying, it would have been a total cost to us of about 27000 for the year. For the why. Thank you. All right. Thanks for that clarification. Anything else, Brandon? Uh, no, nope. I think Kathy did a good job summarizing everything. So I think so too. They stayed busy for a for a very uh, eventful year. So I want to thank. If there's no other questions, I want to thank Soy and Kathy for your presentation here tonight, and wish you all the best in the future. And hopefully things open up instead of close back down. Thank you. I hope so too. Thanks so okay. Much. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, uh, Mike, do we have our, do we have our next delegation ready for us? Yeah, through your workshop, yes. I'm just adding in one now, iPhone. Okay, thank you. Uh, so it's Westwood Estates, uh, phase two and three sewer capacity. Jen and Rob Patton are coming for us. Through your mayor, it's still connecting to audio. Um, John, do you know if it's Rob or Jules Jr., did you say? Uh, 
I think if it's uh, iPhone, it'll be Rob, but it could be Jules. We'll see, obviously. Okay. Okay, so we're just waiting for a second here for for the connection. Uh, that is the there is always a delay, and you can see when you ask a question, it takes a takes a minute for it to get through. So there's a bit of a delay. We get to see John Lampman's shining face on the screen. Yeah, you don't have the girls there, do you, John? They're upstairs. It's bedtime. Oh, oh, bedtime. Okay. All right. It looks like. Do you, oh, sorry, through your mayor, do you want to move on to one while we see if uh, we can get. Okay. We'll, we can do that. I think uh, we'll go to the next uh, department report then. And that's state, uh, statement of council remuneration for 2020. Uh, Tracy. Yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. This is an informational report regarding council's 2020 remuneration. This report is required annually by the treasurer uh, through the Municipal Act. Um, there's a graph attached with the uh, all uh, 2020 remuneration for council. Is there any questions on the report? Did they hear me? can't hear anything. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's something going on here. Sorry, Tracy. I think it passed. <laughs> there they go. Through uh, your worship, members of the council, uh, the report in front of you and the subsequent uh, policy for consideration is a compensation management and job evaluation and maintenance uh, policy and report. Uh, as you can recall, when we want, went through uh, the compensation review for non-unionized staff, this was identified as a uh, policy that we needed to be put in place just for general housekeeping. It has gone before the policy committee and subsequently it's here presented to you today. And it basically outlines the consideration uh, or the best management practices for compensation review, uh, which would have a, uh, a, a or which would have a general budgetary constraints and consideration that would be before council for their uh, consideration. So the recommendation before you is that council receive the report and approve the compensation management policy, job evaluation, maintenance for future implementation. Is there any questions? Questions from council on this policy? Did I miss something? Now it hasn't been passed yet. Has, has it been reviewed? We didn't. We didn't. Did it come back to council? Uh, through your worship, it actually went to the policy committee, okay. and then is here presented to you today. I'm sorry. And it's here today. That's why it's here today. So it was funneled through the policy committee for their review. Um, Jackie, do you know if it? How many times it went there, or was it just once and then it came up? Um, no, I think it just went through the just the initial one. stage. Yeah. Okay. So it goes to the policy committee, but then does it come back to council? Uh, that's why it's here today. That's why it's here now. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Questions? Any questions from council? No questions. We have a recommendation in front of us. Moved by Councillor Nickel, seconded by Councillor Hemming. In favor? Carried. Thank you. I apologize for the last one, Tracy. I didn't have my microphone on. That's what was. Uh, maybe, maybe council muted me. Uh, I think we'll go into the next uh, department report. Or are you ready, Mike? Um, if we can try, it's not try saying connecting to audio for the applicants. So. Okay. All right. Um, this Rob, is can you hear us? It's actually Jules. Can you hear me? Jules. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Awesome. How are you, Jules? Not too bad. All right. Good. So uh, go ahead, Jules. If you'd like to start. Or yes. Jonathan Lampman, are you going to start? Yeah, I could. I could kick okay. it off. So um, the patents uh, have come to us tonight, obviously, as you can see in the request, uh, requesting the sanitary capacity for their phase two and three of the Westwood Estates development. 
Um, the request, I think in speaking with Rob, I haven't spoken with Jules, but I'm sure he will re relay the same message is to keep momentum once they start putting foundations and basements into one and then just to keep the project moving, keep builders there, keep activity and so on and so forth. Uh, that is the request. Jules, if you have anything to add, by all means, please do. Yes, that's exactly what we want. Things keep going here. Uh, there's a lot of activity. Once uh, we get our final, then builders are chomping at the bit to start, uh, start putting holes in the ground here. So there is a lot of activity. So we just want to be ready. We'd like to service phase two, either this fall or early spring of next year. Okay. Any questions here from council on the questions on the request? So, so they're asking to move forward. Uh, Jackie, would you read that recommendation? That they're, we're asking to see if this is what you looking for, Joe. So with input from staff for council consideration, that council direct staff to continue with progress with Westwood Estates development team to satisfy the phase two and phase three residential growth through the development of a subdivision agreement once staff in conjunction with all stakeholders have deemed the file appropriate, acceptable to do so. Does that, are you good with that, Jules? Does that cover what you're looking for? So yeah, so they're, as long as we go through all the steps, they're, they're allowing us for phase two. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes. Yeah, yeah, like again, I just wanna keep things going here. So yeah, okay. we'll do whatever we have to do. Okay, so questions from council. Questions from council? Councilor McClinchy. Um, can we ask about the first phase? But I see you got all the underground services in, uh, in the ground. When do the buildings go up? Are they uh, go up as they're bought? Or I'm not sure what the, uh, what's happening there in phase one. Are all those lots sold right now? They are sold to all the builders. So the four builders that are in there are sold to them. Then they will sell it off. In our agreement, each builder has to put up a model home to start. Yes. But every builder right now does have sales already. So they, they are ready to go okay, with so, actual sales. So Jules, um, yeah. I, I don't, I don't uh, see any buildings going up. Is there anything right ready to go right now? Well, so they won't give us our development agreement yet because we don't have street lights, which is uh, right now there is eight lots allowed to start as of right now. Um, the only reason why they haven't started digging foundations is because our gas isn't in. So they do have a few of them do have permits, I believe. I think Saratoga has one that had called it in, and then Medway Homes has another. So they're just basically waiting for us to get out of their way so they can get their concrete trucks in. Because if we have a trench in front of their lot, it's going to be hard for them to start their house. So they're they're hoping in the next two weeks that they'll start digging foundations. Okay. So, but they, yeah, the other thing is we, we want to get full permits, but I guess we have to get our street lights in. I think they're ordered and they're, it's, it's, it's going to be happening soon, hopefully, and later. That's correct, Jules. Then we get to that interim certificate as part of the subdivision agreement, and then you get full permits and phase one is all good to go. Okay. All right. Thank you. Does that, that answer your question, Councilor McClinchy? So wouldn't that all be finalized before the... I mean, giving these guys a chance, go ahead. Like why, is it all in stages that they have to do this stuff? Go ahead, Jonathan Graham. Uh, through your worship, it, it is through stages. Um, there's interim certificates, there's model homes. Um, and uh, Jules, I think we have a couple more than two now uh, than in terms of model homes, which get, get them in the door to get start moving. Um, and uh, Jules, I don't wanna speak on your behalf here, but. I think we got caught with a little bit of the weather and the pandemic on how we manage moving ahead with development and the pressures of the ex external market as it would be. Uh, but the lack of a better term, you guys are really close to getting this wrapped up. Uh, you know, it's been long through the process, but uh, phase one is humming along pretty good. Yeah, that is exactly right. So last March we hit with COVID, which put us back with everything. So yeah, we should, we're, we're definitely a year behind. Um, and then we had weather, it was very wet servicing it, and so it was uh, it was a hard 
hard project to do, but we're ready to go now. In a, again, through your worship, I can speak on behalf of the permits that are coming in for third party utilities. We pretty much have engaged them in, in dialogue with every third party utility, whether that be Hay, Bell, Rogers, uh, Union Gas. I think Integris was one of the last ones that just needs to be satisfied. So it's, it's coming along. Which is our hydro provider in a, a park help. I should correct that. And, and so Councilor McClinchy, they're just looking to start servicing the next group of houses to begin that process, to keep the, just to keep the momentum and keep oh, it going. Yeah. So Absolutely. any other questions from council? No other questions. So we have a motion in, in front of us. Do you need it read again or no? We need somebody to move it, moved by the deputy mayor and seconded by Councillor Moyer. All in favor, carried. So that's carried. Thank you very much, Jules. All right, thank you. I guess you don't need me anymore, I can sign off. Nope. <laughs> Uh -huh. Well, you can give a sign off if you like. I mean, it's... well, no, I'll keep my hearing in. All right, take care. Thank you. All right, so back to to the uh, department reports. We have a draft uh, commit community volunteer recognition policy, and I think Mike, you're going to speak on that one. Yes, sir, your worship. Um, um, Members of council, um, you have a, a report in front of you. Uh, this uh, policy has gone through policy committee a couple times actually uh, to give background. Um, I did have at the beginning uh, a few more categories, but uh, um, we worked it through and it, it's better probably to start a program like this a little bit smaller and grow into it if it is successful. But the recommendation is adopt a community volunteer recognition policy and direct staff to proceed with the running of the program in 2021. Um, just to highlight, um, basically there is no formal uh, recognition, uh, volunteer recognition in the municipality. Um, and I think traditionally in North Middlesex it's been a really strong uh, volunteer base, but we've seen that kind of start to erode. And I think just even recently, uh, Brandon can confirm that we just saw the Horticultural Society um, uh, soliciting the community for more volunteers. So anything we can do um, to, to recognize the, the hard work that all the community members do put into these, these uh, projects and if we can engage and promote a little bit more volunteerism uh, to step up, uh, we can do what we, uh, hopefully we can recognize that. So we'd like to start with this program in 2021, a very basic, it's got three categories. Uh, basically we run this from uh, April to September um, with the nominations from April to June. Um, we do have a co-op student that's already working on some of the social media promotion side of that. So we're hoping that goes smoothly. Um, ultimately, it will be um, the applications decided through the EDAC committee, uh, Economic Development Advisory Committee, and uh, to make the submissions to council. And council will, will award just a, a, a formal presentation with plaques in September. So if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Okay, questions from Councilor. Councilor Moyer. Uh, did we not have a, a volunteer program previously that we had, uh, had started back a few years well, ago that we had- uh, We had it for the sesquicentennial. <laughs> I thought there was some talk of continuing that on. We, we talked about continuing it on, and this is, we're finally getting to that. It had, oh, okay. it had stalled and, and uh, Mike's picked up the slack on that, and and, and we want to recognize our volunteers. Yeah. I mean, uh, so yeah, it had lapsed. Yeah, okay. It had lapsed, but that was the idea. Of what was going to happen? So. And through your worship, thanks for not making me pronounce that. That is a word that I do struggle with. I'll call it Canada 150. <laughs> but um, I and through uh, some consultation with Jackie, that's why we did bring it back to pull back because I think they had a lot of categories in that Canon 150 and they struggled to fill all the categories. So that's kind of why we want to keep it smaller, um, three, three volunteers throughout the community and maybe hopefully grow the program from there. Perfect. I think the person who started that word is serving a late sentence in Princeton, <laughs> but that's just my, my opinion. <laughs> um, any other questions from council on this? It's, it's a great policy. I really believe it is. So 
No, we have a recommendation in front of us. Looking for Councillor McClinchy, Councillor Hemming. All in favor? Carried. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. I think that's it for our department reports. Uh, passing of accounts uh, from February 26th to March 11th in the amount of $398,644.44. Thank you, Your Worship. This report is looking for a recommendation to pay the, the bills and accounts in the amount of $398,644.44. Are there any questions on the accounts payable? Questions on the accounts? There's gotta be one. Oh, Deputy Mayor Canellison. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Rob. Tracy, I was going through the accounts just before our council meeting here this evening. And I happened to notice that the Friends of the Carnegie Library had two separate contributions, but one seemed to be identical to the other. So my question for you is like, I think it's check number 003595 for 6,000 and 2,000 for a combined total of $8,000. And then later on, there's another check 003921 for $6,000. The two $6,000 amounts are both community development. Is that a duplication or was it two different grants on the community development? Um, hold on a sec. Let me pull that up. One's on page three, the bottom of page three. And the other one's behind that, so look later on. Yeah, I'm not finding it in uh, the scans of the- of And the, the, the other one's on, on page uh, two, the second report, page two. Oh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong check numbers, I'm sorry. I, I wrote the wrong number down. Is it, the one check is 009513 for $6,000 community development grant. Um, I'm gonna, through you, your worship, I'm gonna have to check into that for you, Deputy Mayor. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing it on the list of scanned accounts payable. So I, I, I'm not sure. I know that the 2000 was um, donations we took in for them and then returned returned it to them so they could get uh, donation receipts. Yeah, it's just that the community development grant, there's two there for, for community development yeah. grant, each is $6,000. Yeah, so I yeah. I didn't know if they received two grants or if it's just a duplication. I'll have, I, will, I, I will check on that and get back to you. Um, Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions on the accounts? No other questions on the accounts? Need a motion? Motion to pay by Councillor Moyer, seconder. Councillor Keo, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. And you'll get back, you'll give us, uh, you'll get back to the Deputy Mayor on that, Tracy. Thanks. Okay, committee reports. Uh, Lake Huron Primary. Councillor Hemming, nothing there. Uh, ABCA? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Okay, Blue Water? Yep, okay, nothing to add to that. Any questions on that? No? Uh, EDAC? Councillor Moyer, nothing? Uh, local school advisory, recreation committee, wastewater. On the upgrades, like for the Park Hill splash pad. Nice. It's okay. Um, any questions on that for anyone? No. Uh, wait, water, wastewater. Policy, we brought, there's, they were brought forward here tonight. Fire committee. Okay, thank you. And the aqua. Uh, through your worship, uh, no meeting yet, but I did get notice that the president of aqua will be retiring at the end of this year. Okay. Okay, correspondence. Uh, Board of Health monthly update, February, 2021. Receive and file. Park Hill Carnegie Library Capital Campaign, receive and file. Local municipal responses to North Middlesex support of recommendations from Rural Education Task Force 
recommendations, Adelaide Metcalf, Southwest Middlesex. Uh, February 16th, the letter was sent from the mayor's office to Minister of Education, MPP's office, and the chair of the Thames Valley School Board. Nothing on that. Township of Howick, consider resolution su uh, support regarding uh, requests for amendments to Agricultural Tile Drainage Insulation Act. Receive and file. Township of Brock, consider resolution support for cannabis licensing and enforcement. I support that. Make a motion to support it. Make a motion, motion made by Councillor Moyer to support. Second by Councillor Nickel in favor of that support. Opposed? Two opposed. It does carry to do support that. Township of Archipelago, uh, consider resolution support to review Municipal Elections Act. Receive and file. Uh, City of Sarnia, consider resolution support regarding changes to capacity limits under province's COVID-19 response framework. And right now they're in gray. I mean, they're, they're on lockdown. Okay, nothing else? We don't need a, do we need a motion? Oh, okay, yeah, if questions, make sure you use your microphones or it doesn't go through to Zoom. All right. Uh, other and urgent business. Other business, I think, Jackie, you have one item. Um, through your mayor, um, staff have indicated that there we, um, um, special meeting of council would be advantageous to discuss doctor recruitment and we're looking at next week to establish a special meeting, possibly March 25th at six o'clock and the mayor has indicated that it could be an electronic meeting if council was in favor of that. So that's Thursday. Yes, That's correct. Thursday evening of next week. Would that work for people? Okay. Mayor, so, Mayor Rob, Deputy Mayor. On, on my phone, we have, uh, are you in case we have a local county council virtual meeting at 7 p.m. on the 25th of March? A local visits, yeah, it's something. It's a local visit. So yeah. that. Uh, but we're going to be at six o'clock. Okay. This is strictly a, so I think that should still work out just fine. Very well. All right. All right. Okay, yeah. so we will get that established then. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Any other business? Anyone with other business? Hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, deferred items are in front of you. Um, communications, including county council meeting. Deputy Mayor Canales. Thank you, Mayor Rob. Um, county council was fairly active uh, the last week. There was a couple of interesting things, uh, certainly, there's a report on the uh, Mount Bridges Vaccination Center. They are currently vaccinating approximately 350 people per day, and their goal is to increase that to 500. So it's, it's been a very, very positive experience. Uh, the county also received uh, funding or 5.9 million over four years for community paramedicine to assist people to continue living in their homes as they uh, continue to age. There are currently 870 people in the county waiting for placement. So this is a uh, certainly key. Um, I don't have anything else, Mayor Rupp. I don't know if you have anything you'd like to... Uh, just I would say that the county did pass their budget for 2021, and it's a 1.7% increase. And I'd just like to comment that the budget committee did a great job for the county. Good work. It, it was a very active committee. It was There was a lot of uh, conversation went into that one. Uh, Councillor Moyer, question. Uh, I'm going to, we'll be following up with, uh, engineer. Uh, it was, it was in the budget. It's in the budget. Uh, but I don't want to say too much on it until we actually, I, I'm hoping that we can invite, uh, the county engineer to come again to our office, which he's done before. I have not sent that invitation out yet to him, but, and then, so we can discuss that and other things like the lights here at the end, different things. All right. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was included in the budget. Uh, the, County is setting aside this year four and a half million dollars into reserves for bridges. And they have slated, uh, I believe the slated estimate is four four million two hundred and fifty thousand to spend this year, like for 2021 in the budget. So, and that was the figure that the engineer wanted to get to. And it's taken a few years to get there, 
but uh, finally got to that four and a half million, you know, that, and he's identified that, that that has to be for the next 10 years for the work that has to be done at the county level. So, yeah, that was, and the other thing, a highlight to the budget, I would say was the beginning of the bike lanes, the bike program along Midway, Medway Road. I don't have the map in front of me, but uh, we can get that for you for council if you'd like, but they are starting the, the bike lanes and starting that program. And so that's, that's good news. I mean, they, that was an extra uh, increase of about two and a half million dollars. You know, it's an expensive program. And so, so Mayor Rob, there is hope then that there'll eventually be a bike lane from us in there. The hope that it's from London to Grand Bend, like all the way through there, but yeah. Small steps. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But it's, it is going to be done as roads are being paved. They're not going to go and pave bike lanes on existing, you know, as, as it's being paved. It's not just the cost of the pavement, it's the, the work to get the shoulders up to. Okay. Councilor Moyer, no? Any other questions for council? Councilor Keogh. Um, just when, on your comment there on the Black's Bridge, when would the residents of uh, uh, North Middlesex know if we have some confirmation on it? Shortly, soon? As soon as possible, let me just say it that way. We'll, okay. we'll talk with the engineer and. And I know he's waiting for engineering, some engineering report on it as well to get, because he has to get final numbers as well. So, um, and that has kept going on and to his credit, he's uh, brought that, the engineering forward and uh, he put it in the budget and it's one of the bridges that uh, are, are in the budget. So okay. thank you. Clear, very glad to see that. Jonathan. Through your worship, uh, Tracy has the answer to Deputy Mayor's uh, inquiry about the council payable. Oh, well, go ahead, Tracy. Yeah, through you, your worship. Um, actually, I didn't notice till uh, uh, actually Brandon texted me and pointed out one is uh, friends of Ye Old, Ye Old Town Hall and the other one's friends of Carnegie Hall. So they are two separate community development um, payments. Thank you. Yeah. Two different friends. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Brandon. All right. Is there anything else with the county that uh, questions on the county? No. All right. Then reading of the bylaws. The just two bylaws this evening. The first bylaw 29 is the Thompson drain and it's for first and second reading only and bylaw 30 is your confirming bylaw. So we're looking for first and second reading on both bylaws. Councillor McClinchy, Councillor Keogh, all in favor? Carried. And third and final on bylaw 30 only. Councilor Moyer, Council Nickel, all in favor? Carried. No closed meeting. You got your hand up already, Doreen? In, in, in person, we have Councilor McClinchy ready. Move to adjourn by Councilor McClinchy, seconded by Councilor Keogh, all in favor? I haven't been able to do that for a year. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mike.